Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Zanaida Gould, and I'm the executive director of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. Today, we are joined by legendary Mexican American civil rights photographer, Maria Varela. She will share some of her experiences with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, as well as in the Chicano movement. Before I get started, I want to share that tonight's Macri Talk is part of San Antonio's annual Dream Week, which is an opportunity to commemorate Martin Luther King's legacy and embrace ideas and dreams for the common good. We present Macri Talks year round. So if this is your first time with us, we invite you to join us for future Macri Talks. Without further ado, I want to welcome Maria Varela. Thank you so much for joining us tonight from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you, it's really an honor to be here. And thanks to all those who came in on this, including family and friends. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I was hoping we could just start out with a little conversation and then we're gonna watch a video and then we're gonna come back and talk some more. But uh, first what I wanted to do is ask you if you could tell us a bit about how you ended up with SNCC, how, in say the early 60s, mid 60s, did the civil rights movement call you? It called me through um, working for the Young Christian Students, which was a Catholic social action group that believed that Catholics belonged engaged in society to deal with justice uh, and, and social issues. Uh, and since I didn't like being on my knees doing all that praying, it really appealed to me. Um, mm -hmm. I was with the young Christian students in high school and found them in college. And then they found me after college and asked me if I would be a full-time organizer for them for a couple of years, going to campuses and bringing to them the social issues that we wanted to bring to the forefront. In the process of that, I because there was so much ferment going on in the student movement uh, that um, I ended up attending some meetings where people who had been on the Freedom Rides um, came to talk about Jim Crow South and, and all the horrors that that involved, which so many students at these student groups like the National Student Association, the Students for Democratic Society, um, they knew about, but I think to hear from these folks directly just well, impacted all of us. Um, so I happened to meet a woman named Sandra Kaysen, who ended up marrying Tom Hayden, who was part of the Students for Democratic Society, but then worked for SNCC. Um, and I got a letter from her one day while I was traveling campuses organizing for the young Christian students saying, would you come work for SNCC? And I'm thinking, well, hell no. I mean, it's like, excuse me. I mean, they beat people up down there. They put them in jail. Why would I do that? And then I, it took me like a couple of months. I kept this letter in my suitcase as I'm traveling. And then I thought, well, you hypocrite. You're coming here on these campuses in Northern United States saying, you need to support the student movement, support SNCC, and, I, and they're asking me to go help them, and I'm just saying, no, well, so good Catholic guilt, you know, put me on a bus. <laughs> and I went down about 1963. I was supposed to, and I did it finally because I was told I would be working in the Atlanta headquarters as a secretary, which is a role I was very comfortable with. Well, it didn't take long. Um, before a couple of SNCC workers, Frank Smith and Bernard Lafayette, discovered that I had this background in working for the young Christian students. They were working in Selma, and they said, there is this pastor of the black Catholic parish there, um, St. Elizabeth, I think it was, and he really supports us. He lets us use his spaces, you know, for meetings, um, and a lot of the the black ministers have a hard time doing that because they're either renting their buildings from white folks or they work for white folks and it would get them in a whole lot of trouble. Well, 
Father Ouellette didn't have that problem. And so they said, we really want to support him because he supports us, but he's been hounding us for a literacy project so that people can learn to read to go to vote. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to do that. <laughs> I say, well, I don't either. And they said, well, look, but you're Catholic. You need to go there. You need to support him. Uh, we're Baptists and, you know, we care for this person, but you you guys will understand each other better. I Another one of those things, well, hell no, but I, you know, I couldn't say that to these two guys who were warriors who had been beaten and jailed, and I'm supposed to say, no, I'm too scared. So, so yeah, clearly I went. Um, and Father Let and I really struck it off. And I thought, oh, I'll do my darndest, you know, I'll try and do a literacy project and I'll just find one that already exists and start teaching literacy out of the parish hall. Well, <laughs> that didn't work too well because existing literacy materials all showed white middle class families doing this or doing that. I mean, how would you relate to that? You know, if you were a black janitor in the South, if you were lucky, you were a janitor, you know, or picked cotton or whatever, you're going to supposed to relate to this. So then I realized uh, over time that I had to do something about if we were going to develop our own literacy materials, they had to have illustrations that would show black folks taking leadership in their communities, doing, doing stuff that really helped the communities. So that was the way I ended up in photography. I had never picked up a calendar, uh, a camera before I joined SNCC. I didn't grow up with a camera. I mean, I, and it was because of these professionals like Richard Avedon, my, Matt Heron, and other uh, professional photojournalists or photographers who, who supported SNCC and said, we will take any SNCC staff person, we will train them, we will, help them get the kind of cameras that will work for them um, so that there could be more eyes on the movement in the South. And that's how I ended up. So it wasn't until I started with SNCC in 63, but it wasn't until 65 that, you know, I learned how to use a camera. Um, I, I find it so interesting today that I'm considered the civil rights photographer. I never thought of myself as a photographer. I thought of myself as a organizer or a person who supported organizers, you know, but your legacy takes interesting turns after 50 or 60 years. <laughs> so that's my origin story. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. So that you, you pick up a camera through SNCC and now your photo, your photography, your photographs have been exhibited across the country over the years, including recently this fall at the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. Um, and we're going to show a short video that was produced by the National Museum of Mexican Art about uh, some of your photography from the second half of the 60s. This was shot by Ramona Emerson, um, indigenous filmmaker, and it was shot to um, commemorate the, the anniversary of the MacArthur Fellows, is that correct? 40th anniversary. Yes. 40th anniversary of the MacArthur Fellows, which we'll talk more about uh, after we watch the video. So um, I just want to let the audience know this video is about 20 minutes and it's going to show you a bunch of Maria's photographs and tell you the stories behind them. So then we're going to come back and talk some more. So I'm going to cue that up just now and enjoy. Arthur Fellow Class of 1990. The photographs you are about to see is work that I did as a staff member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, I actually never picked up a camera until 1965, which is two years into my tour of duty with, with SNCC. Um, I did it for practical purposes of doing adult basic education and communication materials but got caught up in the events as communities asked any of us who were on the staff of the SNCC photo department to come into their communities and record events that were going on. So let me start with one of my first images in 1965. 
this is the way it was in Mississippi in the winter. And in that winter of 1965, this really reflected our own depression at feeling that we failed at getting the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party seated at the 1964 Democratic Party Convention. Um, so this is what I wrote to, to illustrate this image. It was the winter of evictions of striking field workers, of old people freezing to death under damp flour sack sheets, of the Klan still celebrating the murders of the three, Goodman, Cheney, Schwerner. We came back from Atlantic City crowned in our powerlessness to start all over again on lonely plantation roads. And that same winter, homeless plantation workers who had been evicted because of wanting to register to vote um, asked the United States Air Force if they could use their Air Force base in Greenville, Mississippi, which had been empty for 15 years. Could they use it for shelter for the winter until they found other places? With no answers after six months of trying, they went anyway and got into the barracks and were about to set up housekeeping when all of a sudden the Air Force showed up and promptly evicted them. So you see here that eviction action and it prompted me, because I was so angry about it, to write that this same year, the U.S. Army in Vietnam was evicting people from their villages so they could search for Viet Cong stashes of weapons and burn their villages down. So the same action was happening in Mississippi. So it was back to the organizing uh, strategies that was really what SNCC was all about. Here we see, this is a campaign poster. People worked with what they had. Uh, this is a campaign poster for an African-American man running for sheriff in Holmes County, I believe. This was Holmes County's Freedom Democratic Party headquarters. Um, so people worked with what they had. But you know, people often think of the movement as protests and uh, strikes and things like that. But really, that was 15% of what was done when we worked in the Black Belt South. It was about organizing. So here you see the strategizing that went out. If you note the map in the background, looking at what had to be done in different precincts. And youth were always involved and always anxious to be involved because they were treated like young adults, not children, and were given important things to do. This to me is really typical of when you see a SNCC staff person. This one happened to be Stokely Carmichael. Stokely's on a march, but he never, marches were never to him about marches. They were about organizing. So he'd go off to the side of the road, talk to people about registering to vote, get their names and addresses, and said somebody would follow up later and talk to them about um, getting involved in the voter registration movement. Stokely did this on the march from Selma to Montgomery. He walked the whole side of the road, all through Lowndes County, getting names, talking to people about getting involved in voter registration. And this was the result a year later, where a third party, which was legal under Alabama law, was established, and they held their first primary. And you can see, basically, that all the work that was done in the movement involved local leaders, local people, who, if it weren't for them, the movement would not have moved. They called themselves the Lowndes County uh, Freedom Organization, but their nickname was the Lowndes County Black Panther Party. And they chose that because of their sense of how the Black Panther defends itself. A lot of people think the Black Panther Party started up in the Bay Area. It did not. It started in Lowndes County, Alabama. And when Stokely was approached by the people in the Bay Area about can we use uh, the Black Panther icon and Black Panther name, he said, you have to ask the folks down in Lowndes County, which they did. 
They called up Mr. Hewlett, asked for permission, he gave it, and that's how the Black Panther Party uh, got established in the Bay Area. But it wasn't all organizing. It was also sort of getting to know folks and getting to know the kind of local culture. This is Pap Hamer. His name is Perry Hamer. He was Fannie Lou Hamer's husband. She called him her rock. You'd never see him at a meeting or a demonstration or anything that Mrs. Hamer would have been involved with. He was there taking care of the home fires and the family. So I found him in the backyard. They had just butchered a pig that day, and he was uh, cooking what is called cracklins in the south and what we call chicharrones here in the southwest and west. Um, so we started talking about similarities in food, and I was comparing cracklins to chicharrones, which my dad just loved, cornbread to corn tortillas, black eyed peas to pinto beans, and Tabasco to salsa, not exactly, but close. Um, and the eight, and I just felt this is an age-old bridge across cultural divides because he was, he was uncomfortable um, with strangers. But this talk about food kind of got him to relax a little enough to give me permission to take his picture. The children were really special. Um, wherever I was, whatever I was involved with with my camera, I always ended up shooting the kids. Uh, these particular kids, <clears throat> um, they were just full of questions. What was I doing? Where was I from? Was I a freedom rider? And they just kept on questioning. And they, they live where they live, you can see, with, their, with life right up in front on their faces. SNCC was responsible for the freedom schools with, upon which the Head Start program was founded. And so this is... This is uh, the first head start in Indianola, Mississippi, which was in an old church. It was cold, and people had to bundle up and have, there was plenty of runny noses and cold hands, but yet these kids hardly missed a day. They loved school, and that was at least those who had shoes. Some kids would actually, some families, one child would get shoes one day and could go to school, and then the next day the child who couldn't go to school got the shoes and could go to school. So it was, um, there was just this drive for, especially among the kids, to try these new things. This is a program that, that Doris Derby, who uh, was a cultural worker for SNCC, started, and that was going to different head starts and talking about Africa. Because kids in Mississippi and throughout the South felt like Africa, there's some, well, they knew Africa through Tarzan, but <laughs> they didn't, you know, their sense of Africa was that there was something wrong with it. And she just did a lot of work with uh, folk stories, artwork, African dress. She showed them how, you know, traditional African dress. And the kids were pretty much just, they, they just loved what she was doing. This is one of my favorites uh, images where you see this was the Meredith March Against Fear. The kids were marching. They were unconcerned about the state police sharpshooter in the back. And I titled this, They Marched Against Fear, led by peers more than parents. They would be the next us. This is true often of the children that I took pictures of, that they came up, they took up the mantle for the next generation to keep on working in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, to bring justice in their communities. So one of the purposes of SNCC photo was to be on marches because they felt that extra eyes might, might keep law enforcement from beating on people uh, if they felt they needed to. Um, but, you know, by 1966, we were really done with marches. And that's reflected in this poem where I say, you know, we marched through the Valley of Dread, reflections in two centuries of tears, not knowing where we would sleep or if morning would come, not knowing would it do any good. This march, the Meredith March Against Fear, came under a different mantra. Um, it wasn't we shall overcome, it was black power. This brought out a whole bunch of new people into the streets 
that felt before they couldn't join these protests under the rubric of nonviolence, not because they wanted to do violence, but because they just felt if somebody attacked them, they'd probably fight back. Um, so we saw a whole different kind of participants. Uh, this is June Johnson, and uh, she was a young SNCC worker. This is the first Black Panther t-shirt. Uh, we're pretty sure because the Black Pan Panther Party was just emerging in Lowndes County. It wasn't yet in the Bay Area. So because word of mouth, there was no internet, word of mouth was the fastest thing across the Black Belt South that crossed over from Alabama into Mississippi. And here we see this hand-drawn uh, t-shirt. And you can see from the expressions on the people in the back, they were marching under black power. This photograph is something that mainstream media was never interested in. It, and <laughs> because they always felt like the marches and the protests were all of these kind of uh, upbeat uh, things. But here you see, and I call this burdens of resistance because by this time, this was oh, a couple, several weeks into the march. People were tired. There were things happening along the march route that had people upset. You see Dr. King really um, in a meditative pose, looking burdened down, as, do you, as is Stokely Carmichael to his right. Um, the same thing for John Lewis, who was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This was an especially hard time for him as he felt that he distinguished himself from the, so, the whole black power concept. Um, so from here, I went to New Mexico at the invitation of Reyes Lopez de Herina. I did that because when I worked in the South, I noticed that the farmers or people who had land, they were usually first to begin organizing because they had their land they didn't depend on white people for a whole lot. They did depend on them for some things, but it's not like people who didn't have land and who needed uh, to have their jobs with white folks. So Reyes Lopez de Herida was the head of the land grant movement in New Mexico and invited me to come and join him. And I felt, you know, that's where we need to be. We need to look at keeping the land base across this country of indigenous people, of African-American people, of Latino people, because we're t we're, we will be renters in our own land if we don't keep our traditional land. So this is the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. Dr. King invited Reyes and other Latino groups to join him in Washington, D.C. before he was assassinated. After he was assassinated, his organization decided to keep on because this is Dr. King's dream to bring people of color together uh, and to form alliances. Here's Reyes with Corky Gonzalez in the background coming to the Mexican consulate to say to them, you signed a treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which protected our people's land, but you've never enforced it in the world court and our lands were taken. So. Reyes joined the Poor People's Campaign because he wanted to bring the land grant movement to the national stage so it would be seen more nationally as an important issue. And there were several people, some people who had never been on an airplane, who came to, or a bus actually, and who came to D.C. I think we were there for four weeks. And we did our own marches because uh, we didn't find people in charge of the Poor People's Campaign necessarily responsive uh, to either our issues or to Native American issues. And so we created our own um, strategies to bring our issues before people in the government. In this image, we can see the Brown Berets were ready to march to the U.S. Justice Department to protest police brutality, and they got interdicted by DC cops and the uh, park police. I really wish I could have gotten more of an expression on the gentleman who's beating on that young man, but he so frightened me because he had this look 
of rage and fear that just was uh, terrorizing. The Chicano uh, delegation was really instrumental in helping the Native American folks come to the fore because they, they dropped between the cracks. When they got to D.C., they were never invited to the sort of main organizing meetings. And so we worked with them uh, on their issues. Here you see uh, Corky Gonzalez with uh, Gerald Wilkinson and uh, other people, other indigenous people, um, bringing the cause of Native people before the Department of Justice. So we were building alliances as we went along with other organizations nationally uh, around the issues that Chicanos in the Southwest faced. Here you see the Puerto Ricans were so good at this. They decided people had enough talking and enough protesting at different buildings. Let's throw a fiesta. And they threw a great fiesta with wonderful food and music. And here you see uh, Reyes de Herina to the left, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who took over from Dr. King after he was assassinated, and Herena Valentin, a, a, a longtime civil rights or uh, activist for the Puerto Rican community, together at this fiesta. In the next slide, you see people who never actually would have ever gotten a chance to meet each other, uh, Black Berets, Brown Berets, and the Young Lords, and they always formed security for all the, the leaders of the different um, cultures that were there. But they also sort of um, developed really good relationships between them. But this is my favorite illustration of <laughs> building alliances, because after all, you know, all movement building and all uh, developing relationships between people, it is about building relationships. And you see, I really overlooked this image for such a long time. And then when I looked at it more closely, you could see in different parts, people who were getting together um, and sharing stories and lives and, and whatever. It, it's, it really reflected to me uh, one of the wonderful outcomes of the Poor People's Campaign. And finally, this is when we all joined together because two weeks before the Poor People's Campaign, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated and was buried up at Arlington. And people felt, uh, there are many groups that felt a big connection, a deep connection with Robert Kennedy. And so the, group, the organizations made the decision, we're going to go to Arlington and honor him where he is buried. And that's how we, we finished up the Poor People's Campaign. Reflecting on these images makes me realize that um, they're not old, they're not vintage. Uh, yeah, some of them are 60 years old, but we're facing so many of these same things today. Um, we face the critical need to build bridges between the different uh, races and cultures in our country because we are under assault in so many ways, starting with voting which was a centerpiece of our work in SNCC, um, and ending with all kinds of programs for communities to take their own power and create a different life. So unfortunately, some of these issues that these images addressed are with us today, and they're going to be with us tomorrow. And so I think for future generations, we need to understand that our power is in learning each other's histories, and our power is in organizing, getting off the streets, getting into the communities, and finding out what people need and what they want to make their life better.
That was a very powerful video. Again, that was courtesy of the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, which hosted an exhibition of some of Maria Varela's artwork last fall. And so, Maria, I, I have some questions. Um, what an amazing life. So I, in particular, I want to talk to you about your, your, the way that you connected what you saw, what what you experienced um, in SNCC, and then and then you you move to the Southwest and you draw connections. But can you tell us more about what led you to to get from SNCC to New Mexico? You know, I talk a lot about movements are built on invitations. People invite you, um, and I think that's a lesson for today. They, movements don't get built on ideology. They don't get built on, you know, here's a reading list. <laughs> They're built because somebody says, you know, I noticed you can do this and we could use this, you know, this a lot in our movement. Would you be willing to join? So that's how this happened. There was a new politics conference that was going to be in Chicago, I think in 1967. And Julian Bond called me one day when I was in Mississippi and said, you know, we've invited Reyes Lopez Tijerina to Chicago to the New Politics Conference. You know, we don't even know if he speaks English. Would you please come to Chicago and be there to host him, you know, and help him, you know, go through whatever is needed to be a part of this conference? So I thought, well, that's interesting, yeah. I, I hadn't heard of the land grant movement. Remember, there's no internet. There's no New York Times in Tougaloo, Mississippi, right? It's like you, finding out about anything was either word of mouth, but you'd have to travel hundreds of miles to find out what's going on in different movements. So I went to Chicago out of curiosity and met him, uh, and we get, got along really well. Reyes was very interested in how the African-American movement had built its strength and dominance in terms of movement terms uh, in the country. And he wanted that for the land grant movement. So after he went back to New Mexico and I came to Mississippi, I got a letter from him saying, would you please come and work with your people to New Mexico on the land grant issues um, because we, we need you. So there's the invitation. I was wrapping up my work in the South anyway because of the black power uh, phenomenon. A lot of foundations were no longer supporting SNCC and a lot of my work had been supported by those foundations. And so um, I decided between several other Chicano movement locations, whether in Texas or California, to go to New Mexico for the reason I said in the video, which is that we had to secure our land base so we wouldn't be renters in our own land. So that was the connection that led me to that. Um, to that. Yeah. It's okay. So then, so then you get to um, the Southwest and you're making these connections between land um, and the fact that after the treaty, well, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, everyone who owns land pre-1848, uh, people of, of Mexican descent were supposed to be able to hang on to their land. And what in fact happens is lots and lots of Mexicano families lose their land um, from Texas to California, right? And, um, and so could you just talk a little bit more about the connections between, for example, uh, New Mexican um, uh, land grant holders fighting to hold on to land or 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 um, fighting against the fact that their land was taken from them and the loss of land that African Americans in the South were experiencing. You know, uh, some of it boils down to the fact that um, pro property law in the United States doesn't observe um, either communal lands or in some cases like family holdings and how family hand down uh, land to each other. And uh, certainly in terms of the African-American experience in the Black Belt South, um, if you didn't have a will, 
in terms of who your land was going to go to, it went to probate court. And there were always these vultures perched on the edge of probate court waiting to sort of um, divide and conquer the heirs and buy them off so that they could pick up this some of this very rich agricultural land across the Black Belt South for a song. And the same thing was happening in New Mexico because so much of the land was held in common. The biggest part of the lands up in the mountains where people grazed their animals was common land. Well, there's no recognition of that in New Mexico property law. So the vultures again swooped in and figured out how to, how to make that happen. When I worked for Reyes, because that's what I did, he hired me at $7 a week. <laughs> well, his ladies were the ones that made sure I got to $7 a week and they fed me too. But when I worked for Reyes in Albuquerque, I'd sometimes go north with his brother Chemo and, um, and be listening to him talking to the Hitos, the older, um, the sort of embattled people who have been battling for generations to keep their land. And I just picked up that this, this had to be worked on, but really could you go to the world court and eventually that should happen? Really would Congress ever rectify what they screwed up? Eventually that might happen. But I thought, well, let's get real here because people aren't getting what they need for their livestock in livestock markets. And that's why these counties where most land grant people live were the poorest in the United States. Some of them not much, you know, some of them equal to Mississippi counties, Alabama counties, because they couldn't access uh, the kind of markets they needed in terms of what they were growing small scale. So I don't know how I got into it, but this because listening to people and the fact that they were going to have to sell their livestock, sell their land, you know, just to keep up with taxes or somebody got cancer in the family, you got to pay the medical bills. There was no Obamacare at that time, you know, so that's what led me to kind of work for, oh gosh, probably 40 years on how to make these cultural and traditional lands um, enough to support people, uh, not in a great lifestyle, but so that they could at least hang on the lands and pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. So that was my work in Northern New Mexico. You, at the beginning of the talk, described that um, it, it's a little surprising to you that people now associate you so strongly with your photography because you understand yourself as a community organizer. Yeah. Um, but um, can you just uh, talk a little bit more about the different things you were involved in during the Chicano movement? I know you, in fact, you were present at quite a few important events. You know, I was thinking uh, today, one of the things that I often don't talk about because it's sort of imploded in our faces. <laughs> in, 19, in the mid 60s, there were 33 community newspapers across Latino communities from California all the way to the Midwest, to Chicago. Um, and they wanted to come together. And some of us, because I was a photographer and writer and would write for some of these papers, I felt like we needed a Chicano Press Association and so began talking to people in the different communities. You know, this is by telephone, <laughs> this is by snail mail, uh, about what if we formed a Chicano Press Association that could find a way to get photographs about stuff happening in Albuquerque to Chicago, stuff happening in California to Albuquerque. It was a really exciting idea. So I raised a little money and we got a conference that was supposed to happen in Albuquerque. I made sure that Nobody would be upset about where they were staying, the kind of food they got. I made sure that the little old ladies at the parish hall where we were having it in a barrio would be feeding the, their best food. And it blew up. It blew up because the Tejanos and the Californios just blew it up. <laughs> I'm not going to go into detail about it, but to say, you know, and that, that, what, that happens sometimes, but um, so I was involved with that for a good year and doing photographs and sending them off to these papers. I uh, did some photographing of the Brown Berets in Albuquerque, um, also at, at the United Farm Workers, and in Denver. I did 
uh, I did some work up in Denver with uh, Corky Gonzalez and his organization. Yes, they were really, as an urban-based organization, very strong in how they built uh, a whole political machine to kind of really begin to make inroads and have Chicanos hold office in Denver. So those were places where I worked that I remember anyway. There were others too, but because you get a call saying, oh, there's going to, oh, the first Chicano Youth Conference, which which Corky had in Denver back in 68. Um, so I came up and I photographed that. Yeah. By the time um, you get to 1990, in 1990, you received the, prestig the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship, often called the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, can you tell us how that happened? <laughs> I have no idea because you can't nominate yourself. The nominators, and I think it's still true today, it was all secret. Um, I get this phone call out of the blue in my office up at uh, Ganados del Valle, which is a nonprofit that I help with my neighbors up there to start to do this work around agriculture, weaving, raising sheep. Um, and I get this call from this man who I'd never heard of and he said, I just wanted to let you know that you've been awarded a uh, MacArthur uh, Fellows. Oh, whatever, I can't remember. I said, really? <laughs> I didn't believe it because what I knew about the MacArthur Fellows is that they went to people who chore they did ballet, they did opera, they did, you know, they were, they were academics, um, but as far as community organizers, I just thought somebody was playing a joke here. So I listened to him. I, listened to him. I didn't say hardly anything. And then I said, uh, you're going to send me a letter, right? <laughs> he laughed and he said, yes, I am. Well, that particular, um, between I think 89, maybe a little earlier, and up until about 95, that the MacArthur Fellows did recognize people like Bob Moses um, and other people who had worked in organizing and in different movements because they felt like they needed to break away from what they considered as American culture or American contributions. Um, so I happened to ride that wave and it was interesting. It lasts for five years. You get a lot of people who ask if you could help them with money, <laughs> but um, it's always been a great group when we get together to sort of share um, each other's worlds and learn from each other a lot. Yeah. I value that. Well, and it's so amazing to me that that was an opportunity to shed light on this centuries old situation now with um, particularly uh, rural um, communities and that th the impact of land rights and water rights in just their daily lives. Because I think a lot of us, but for those of us who live in cities, we don't necessarily think about that sort of thing. But um, this is an ongoing issue, not just in the Southwest, but, but even um, in, in the Southeast of that generational loss of land, um, our communities getting separated from our kind of roots in the land and the vast implications that it has for us, whether it's economic implications or even health implications. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, the fact that they recognized your work was a way of shining a light on that. I do think that because we were talking about a different kind of economic development, um, mm -hmm. but listening to you, it, it occurs to me that one of the big generational breaks that happened in the 80s and the 90s, I think, people used to send their kids down either to Mississippi and Alabama to the grandparents, or they send them from Denver or Albuquerque, you know, up to northern New Mexico to be with the grandparents. And the kids got a chance to experience the language. They got a chance to experience the folkways or the things that people did. Um, there were so many kids who really valued that relationship to their grandpa who taught, who taught them about, you know, raising sheep or cattle and grandma who taught them, you know, the old foods. And we've lost that. And I think that was one of the things that fueled 
not just um, rural people, you know, holding up the banner for their land rights and their water rights, but urban people supporting that, you know, especially urban Latino and, and black folks supporting that because they had that connection. They knew how important it was for families. And, and, you know, a lot of these older people have kind of gone on over the bridge. And um, so we have to find a way to reconnect, especially the young people, you know, to these customs and these cultures, because these things are what help us understand how to live sustainably um, in terms of arid Southwest and, you know, deep South uh, small land holdings and what can be done to to keep that base. It just, we just can't let it go. Right, right. Um, I, I do have a, we have a question from one of our viewers. So I wanna ask it. So this is a, a question from uh, Dr. Enrique Aleman uh, here in San Antonio. He says, today everyone has access to a camera with video in their phone and social media has been used by youth and community activists to organize. Has the power of a still shot remained the same? How does the power of an image influence the way we organize and tell our stories? That's interesting because I just listened to a documentary about that. I mean, it, first of all, it's true. You've got this pervasive, but, but look, I mean, look at George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't had that witnessing, um, not just George Floyd, but uh, you know, so many other situations. If we hadn't had that witnessing, the whole complaining that's been going on for generations in people of color communities about police brutality um, has just broken wide open because of the witnesses. Of the, so I, I'm not one of those who looks down on my nose in terms of people who use their phone, I do, you know, I also take some of my better shots are off of my phone. Um, it's like, it's a democratization in a sense of image making. And some of those images can really change. They can produce change if it's well managed and there's good organizing that goes on around it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I know we, um, we've covered a lot of ground here, but I, I do just want to see if, if you have any thoughts about lessons from the 1960s, maybe early 1970s civil rights movement that really still matter today, that we need to have on our radar today. One of the things that I was struck with, I think it was, remember the, the whole Ferguson blow up um, and around police brutality and and sort of the misbehaving of, of the government in Ferguson. Uh, and I remember reading an article where a young person was asked by a reporter about, well, what's needed here in Ferguson? You, you're a majority black community. And he said, we don't have our Dr. King. And that broke my heart because it means because of how the media and often history and academia has treated the civil rights movement as really dependent on one great leader. People feel powerless if they don't have a great leader in their communities leading them, you know, out of the morass that they're in. And I think that we learned that in SNCC. That was our whole um, mm -hmm. focus is that it's not about the great leaders. That's an old theory of history. It's called the, the great man theory of history. Look it up, there is such a thing. And that's like 18th, 19th, 20th century. We need to understand that today, that our strength is in the, the leadership we can percolate up from the community. The young folks, those 14 and 15 and 16 year olds, that are just champing at the bit to do something. I mean, that's what we did in the South. We, they had really important jobs in our movement. We took them seriously and they took their job seriously. We have to really 
get back to those basics or we're just going to be enslaved with this view that we have to have a great leader to take us from here to there. One of the things that really struck me in the video that we watched is you were talking about all of the community people who were involved and you said if it weren't for them the movement would not have moved yeah i love that it's so true and lowndes county was just uh incredible when you watched how that sort of evolved and and every, so many places in mississippi gosh some there were some folks who were brilliant organizers it's like they figured out early on that if they train voters to here's because people had after they got rid of the literacy things and the 1965 voters, you know, act that got rid of some of the, the poll tax and all the stuff that kept people from voting. Well, they would we would train people in in voter registration classes to here's the candidates that we want and here's the order that they'll be in on the ballot. Well, the white folks figured out how to change the ballot the morning of the election. So right away there's this guy that was in i think he was in holmes county uh, or, or canton mississippi he was brilliant and he went first thing or had somebody go first thing got the exact thing it was everybody who was going to vote had to stop by the cafe have a cup of coffee and then he said here's the way the voting goes i mean there were folks that because of the movement and because of our emphasis on local folks they just blossomed and they just they were so creative in how they kind of worked, you know, for power to get power in their communities. But we saw that firsthand, you know, and that's what you're transformed by that. Once you have, go through that transformation, you don't go back. You know, you just say, well, this is kind of what we have to do. And it's hard work and it's takes a long time. Yeah. We have another audience question. This is from Marty Williams, who wants to know if you have um, published a book or will publish a book with a compilation of your photography. <laughs> well, if somebody invited me, I probably would. Um, this book idea has been going around for about two decades now. And it's like, it's, it's terrifying for me to think I can manage a chapter. It's like, I have a chapter in uh, Hands on the Freedom Plow before this book, so many people had the impression that it was mainly men, you know, who moved the movement, the civil rights movement. Well, if you read this book, Hands on the Freedom Plow, you 51 women, and they talk about the work they did in the movement. And you realize that that was moving the movement was what the women were doing. So I, I do have an essay in there. Also, um, we have the SNCC Digital Gateway which was put together at Duke University. And it's, it's a lot about the work that we did in SNCC. And there's a chapter um, on there of my work and it's called Learning from Experience, uh, part one, two, three, and four. And you can see how we learned, how we evolved what we learned and you know, under sort of the, under the tutelage of the local people that we worked with. But yeah, I'd love to have a book of some of my photographs. Now that I found a lot of my Chicano movement images, which were lost for like three decades. And recently I found them. And um, But th those books are very expensive and mm -hmm. publishers make decisions on what will sell, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if it would sell. Well, I put in the um, uh, chat, I put the link to Hands on the Freedom Plow if you would like to order a copy of that. It's from the uh, University of Illinois Press. And also on the screen, I'm showing the link to the SNCC Digital Gateway, which you can also just um, search that on the internet, SNCC Digital Gateway. There's a ton of great information in there, including a lot of stuff from uh, Maria Varela. Um, and uh, let's see, I think there was one last question. Oh, yes. So I wanted to ask um, uh, just a question based on um, kind of the direction that your work went in over the years. And that's, um, where do you see, um, where do you see things moving for environmental justice? Of course, as everybody knows, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. And um, that climate crisis is disproportionately impacting communities of color across the globe, not just here in the US. But um, just, you know, I, I know you, you did a lot of, of work on uh, with 
again, land and water, but I'm just wondering, where do you see that going? Well, for about five years, I did for a while, I was an adjunct professor at Colorado College and myself and the head of Southwest Studies designed this community-based research program. And we got invited to help some mine workers, uh, uranium mine workers and, and mill workers and ore haulers. Um, they got so tired of waiting for some university to come and do a study on their, their illnesses. They were in 45 and 50 experiencing an incredible amount of illness uh, going on. That was not the usual respiratory stuff that the literature was saying was the only thing that afflicted minors. They were saying, no, there's a lot more afflicting our folks. And so they had started their own um, survey. <laughs> they were amazing people. You know, these are folks that maybe finished high school, but they, they were so knowledgeable about their situation. So they, so we worked for about, I don't know, three, four, five years to get the findings of the, of the, what they had done. Um, and they organized to get people, you know, to respond to these surveys. And so just recently, and this is the lesson, it's not going to happen tomorrow. We started this work back in, I think, 96, 90, in any case, just this congressional session did Congress extend the benefits to this group of uranium workers because they had shut them down at 1972. After that, you couldn't apply for benefits because you weren't supposed to be sick because the government had fixed the mines, which they did not. And so these folks worked and organized and we made a slideshow and they took it to Capitol Hill. Make a long story short, um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on on the indigenous lands and in rural areas, which is the contamination, you know, by resource extraction. And that's kind of been my experience. And I, I know that the whole climate change thing is turning young kids of all colors and all classes really um, into activism. And that's, that's a good thing. We just have to get real about how to do this. Um, so that we can make those changes. Yeah. I can't believe our hour has flown by, Maria. It has been so such a, a pleasure and an honor to speak with you tonight and hear from you firsthand your stories uh, from the Chicano movement and beyond. Um, we know the movement is not over and I just really appreciate you sharing all of this with us tonight. Um, I also wanna thank, of course, our funders who make programs like tonight's event possible, the city of San Antonio, AARP, Wells Fargo, members of Macri's Patronato, and individual donors like, um, like our viewers. If you watch tonight's presentation, I encourage you to learn more about Macri and how you can support our vision for a national center dedicated to preserving and disseminating Mexican-American civil rights history by visiting our website at somosmacri.org. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. And thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Let me just say one final thing. Movements are like the tides. You can't force them to come in, but you can't stop them when they do. And we're in that situation right now where the tides are building. So be patient and wait for, wait for your tide to come. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful way to end tonight. Have a good night, everyone. Night, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>